The glistening curvy bottle, the frosty fizz, the tangy sweetness, and that classic red and white label. As far as the world is concerned, there is only one soda, Coca-Cola. But before they taught the world to sing and reinvent the image of Santa Claus, Coca-Cola began as a humble patent medicine. But by pairing a product everyone loves with clever and decisive business strategies, this one-time snake oil elixir grew into one of the most recognizable brands in the world. This is the rise of Coca-Cola. Enjoy. While the Coca-Cola company now famously resides in Atlanta, Georgia, it began in Columbus, Georgia, back in 1885. Confederate Colonel John S. Pemberton sought a suitable replacement for morphine, to which he became addicted following the war. Pemberton, who had held a medical degree, found inspiration in French cola wine, literally wine infused with cocaine. In particular, Pemberton based his tonic on the popular Vin Marion, created by Persian chemist Angelo Mariani and enjoyed by literary figures like Jules Verne, Alexander Dumas, and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Pemberton's recipe also included the African cola nut, utilized for its abundance of caffeine. Move over, Red Bull. This new wonder tonic, Pemberton's French wine cola, quickly caught on as an intellectual beverage among the rich and elite with claims to cure ailments such as heartburn, nausea, headaches, and even impotence. But the party nearly stopped when Atlanta passed prohibition laws in 1886, because of course the most troublesome ingredient was the wine. Without the wine, Pemberton loaded his tonic with sugar to cover the bitterness of the coca and cola, the first of only a handful of changes made to the formula even to this day. The absence of wine also forced Pemberton to alter the name of his creation. Bookkeeper Frank M. Robinson made branding history by suggesting that Pemberton simply named the new formula after its main ingredients, coca and cola. Robertson also suggested changing the K in cola to C, saying the two Cs would look well in advertising. Even the Spencerian script used for the new universally recognizable logo was a common font used by accountants in those days. Robinson thought it would help differentiate Pemberton's product from its competitors. Today, over 100 years later, the Coca-Cola logo has remained largely unchanged. These choices laid the foundation for the core branding concepts that would lead Coca-Cola to world domination. Since its inception, Coca-Cola has prioritized two concepts, making a well-loved product and creating a strong brand identity. To market test his formula, Pemberton would send his nephew, Louis Newman, to local pharmacies with samples of his concoction, tailoring the recipe based on customer feedback. To this day, Pemberton's original formula is locked in a vault at the Coca-Cola Company in Atlanta. Coca-Cola was first sold at Jacob's Pharmacy in Atlanta, Georgia on May 8, 1886, for five cents, and would remain five cents all the way until 1959. Soon, the Coca-Cola legacy began to take shape. Prior to his death, Pemberton sold off portions of his company, with the majority going to Atlanta businessman Asa Candler. However, Pemberton declared that the name Coca-Cola belonged solely to his son, Charles. This would become a constant sticking point for Candler, who produced beverages using Pemberton's original formula, but under lackluster names like Yum Yum and Coke with a K. Charlie Pemberton, on the other hand, peddled crude swill of his own under the more illustrious Coca-Cola moniker. As soon as Pemberton died on August 16th, 1888, Candler quickly schemed to purchase the name, allegedly even approaching Pemberton's widow at the funeral with $300 cash. Unfortunately, Charlie Pemberton had his own vices and met an untimely demise on June 23rd, 1894. By the end of August, Candler had become the sole proprietor of the Coca-Cola name. Candler's only objective was to make Coca-Cola the most popular drink in the world. He began by incorporating the Coca-Cola company and expanding distribution of the syrup to soda fountains around the country. He outfitted pharmacies with free pendants, posters, and other swag bearing the Coca-Cola logo. 
He kickstarted a massive free drink initiative, resulting in more than 8.5 million drinks, roughly 10% of all products from 1887 to 1920, to be given away for free. Candler pioneered brand awareness strategies by affixing the Coca-Cola product with a broader image. Advertising contained variations of delicious, refreshing, and of course, enjoy. But these strategies were just the tip of the frosty, cold iceberg. Coca-Cola was initially sold to pharmacies and soda fountains as a syrup. At the time, drinking soda at home or on the go really wasn't a thing. An increase in demand eventually sparked innovation. In 1894, Mississippi businessman Joseph Bidenharm made the revolutionary decision to bottle the Coca-Cola beverage, making the world's first portable fountain drink. Suddenly, Coca-Cola found its way right into customers' homes. While this did boost the brand significantly, it also brought some unforeseen consequences. While Coca-Cola was a smash among well-off whites, the drink was completely inaccessible to minorities who were barred from the segregated soda fountains. Now in bottles, Coke became available to a whole new demographic. Resistant to this new egalitarian soda market, middle-class white folks began voicing unfounded concerns over the exploding cocaine use among African Americans. By 1903, between angry white mobs and emerging narcotics legislation, Candler decided to replace cocaine with even more sugar and caffeine, only the second major change to the formula up to this point. Though this was ultimately the right decision, its reasoning is unfortunate to say the least. Candler was responsible for two more major aspects of the growing brand. First, in 1899, he sold exclusive bottling rights to two Tennessee lawyers, Benjamin F. Thomas and Joseph B. Whitehead, for only $1, beginning a franchise partnership known as the Coca-Cola System. To this day, Coca-Cola is not one large company, but a system of over 275 independent bottlers around the world. The first and perhaps most significant impact Candler had on the company was the ubiquitous bottle. In 1915, Candler was losing market share to cola counterfeiters prompting a nationwide contest for a new bottle design as well as an advertising campaign encouraging the public to demand the real thing. Earl Dean, supervisor of the Root Glass Company in Indiana, based his design on a misunderstanding of the name. His design, which ultimately became the winner, was inspired by the curvy ridges of the Cocoa Pod. Coca-Cola, of course, does not contain cocoa. In fact, by this point, it didn't even contain cocaine anymore but for some reason, people still drank it. Still, the design was chosen and has since been galvanized as a major staple of American culture. Over the decades, Coke would slowly make its way onto the world stage. In 1928, they became a sponsor of the Olympics, but it was World War II that truly solidified Coca-Cola's place as a global brand. As US troops demanded Coke overseas, the company responded by building bottling plants all over Europe. From 1940 through 1960, the number of countries bottling Coke would double. As decades passed, Coke would bring more innovations, bigger bottles in 1955, introducing metal cans in 1960. But by 1973, Coke's biggest rival, Pepsi, introduced the world's first two liter bottle. Because of patenting rights, it would be a full seven years before Coke could respond with its own two liter bottle. Coke even began diversifying, purchasing Minute Maid in the early 60s. In 1982, Diet Coke hit the shelves, allowing suburban fast food consumers to lie to themselves about being healthy for decades to come. For most of its history, it seemed Coke could do no wrong. But in 1985, one terrible marketing decision nearly brought it all crashing down. In an attempt to maintain cultural relevance and market dominance, Coke decided to alter its formula for the first time in decades. After numerous blind taste tests proved favorable, the company decided to roll out new Coke to immediate apocalypse level public backlash. Company experts have since labeled it as one of the worst marketing decisions of all time. However, the company found a silver lining amidst all the chaos. They witnessed firsthand the deep abiding love consumers had for their classic brand and product, uncovering the most powerful concept in all of marketing, nostalgia. 
Since then, the company has leaned hard into their legacy while further deepening the personal relationship with their fan base over the years. Today, Coca-Cola is one of the most recognized brands of all time. They are the number one soft drink and the fifth most consumed beverage in the entire world. They constantly rank in the top 100 businesses on Forbes magazine's Fortune 500. More than that though, they are a powerful brand that has championed its product over a century while sticking to its timeless basic values with their core message being something so fundamental, so simple, and so universally human, a positive experience. Essentially, Coke hasn't built its name on selling a drink in a bottle, but attempting to sell happiness itself.